Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. It's a proof text. In fact, I would argue this is the foremost proof text to show that Christians today do not need to keep the Sabbath. They're under no obligation, no requirement whatsoever. It's not necessary. And it doesn't stop there. Traditional understanding and what's being taught from the pulpits today is the following, that if in fact you cling to these things and you attempt to say, well, these are required, you're not just a legalist, but you're actually denouncing Christ. Your radical observance of these things is a rejection of Yeshua himself. That's an incredible charge when you think about it. That's a credible thought. And this whole concept of placing anyone who is going to keep the commandment of God, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, and, and viewing them as a legalist, it's a serious charge. Anytime you start talking about the commandments of God and that they are no longer required, with all due respect, it's a life and death conversation and you need to investigate. No question about it. Because one thing I know is when you go back to the garden, this is what the enemy did. The deceiver came in and he questioned the commandment, God, no, it's not necessary for you to abstain from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's not necessary. And so anytime we get into a conversation like this, yes, it merits your undivided attention. Listen to these words. He says, but as to their, meaning the Jews, scrupulosity concerning meats and their superstition as respect the Sabbath, and they're boasting about circumcision and their fancies about fasting and the new moons, which are utterly ridiculous and unworthy of notice. These things that we read about in Colossians 2.16, the feasts, right? You talk about the new moon, the Shabbats, making the distinction between clean. These things are ridiculous and unworthy of notice. That is the strongest language you could possibly use. This is back in the second century, mid-second century. So here's the deal. As, as you look at some of the commentators today, some of the preachers from the pulpit today, understand something. This stuff is not new that we're hearing today. This perspective, this goes all the way back. Well, let me show you what some of the modern day uh, commentators are saying of which pastors today are drawing from. This is the exposition of Colossians. This is by Hendrickson and, and Kistemaker. What justification could there be for imposing upon converts from the Gentile world the observance of the Jewish Sabbath? When the bringer of eternal rest is urging everyone to come unto him. Do you understand what he's, what he's proposing here? He's making it look at you can either grab hold of the Jewish Sabbath or you can grab hold of Christ. And if you're going to grab hold of Jewish Sabbath, then, then you're abandoning Christ. But if you accept Christ, you will abandon the Sabbath. This is what's being conveyed. The Old Testament uh, regulations had served a real purpose. But now that Christ and salvation in him had arrived, what further use could such shadows serve? Though it was not wrong for the Jew, trained from his infancy in the law for a period of transition to observe some of these customs as mere customs, having nothing whatever to do with salvation. I, I struggle with in, in the context of the following. The words of Yeshua in Matthew 19, when the young rich man comes to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. He goes on and he says this, it was certainly wrong to ascribe to them a value which they did not have and try to impose them upon the Gentiles. There's no value in the Jewish Sabbath. This is what Christians are being taught today. There's no value in the Jewish Sabbath. There's no value in making a distinction between clean and unclean or in the festivals, in Passover, right? Yom Kippur, the, this is explicitly 
referring to Colossians 2. This is a response to this. Let me show you another response to Colossians 2 from another scholar, Dr. McNaughton. Paul, who is saying here that believers are under no obligation to keep the Jewish Sabbath, i.e. Saturday, now that the new covenant has come. This is a very simple assessment. When you read Colossians 2, 16 and 17, and this is what people are walking away from. We're not supposed to do these things. Christians are not supposed to bother themselves with these things. Dr. Wall says the following. The list of these celebrations, which includes a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day is fairly typical since the list encompasses annual festivals such as Passover or Yom Kippur, monthly meetings such as the new moon celebration, and the weekly observance of Sabbath. It is evident that Paul's opponents required a rather comprehensive obligation. Moreover, within Judaism, most of these celebrations were intended to help the community look forward to Messiah's deliverance of Israel from its suffering and to its entrance into God's promised shalom. That's an interesting assessment. Because even this particular scholar, he recognizes that, you know, the, the festivals are prophetic in nature and they declare, they're proclaiming Messiah's deliverance for his people. I agree with that. But then we get to this. Thus, for the Christian to participate in these Jewish celebrations was tantamount to a denial of Jesus's Messiahship. The one thing that I struggle with and that terrifies me is this question. And at the very least, I'm asking every Christian to ask the question, what if that's the wrong assessment? What if these commentators, these scholars, the early church fathers, what if they misunderstood what Paul was really saying? What are the implications of something like that? You cannot even calculate it. I will tell you this, one of the most influential passages in shaping Christianity today is Colossians 2.16. And the understanding, the traditional understanding of that passage. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch our video. We hope that it blessed you and it encouraged you. And if it did, please hit the thumbs up on the video and share it with your friends and family. It's also, if you haven't already considered, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, if you'd like to watch the entire video, click on this link. And if you'd like to watch the entire series and learn more about what we, we do and believe here at Corner Fringe Ministries, click on this link. Once again, I'd like to thank you for watching the video, and we hope to see you again soon. Shalom.